Hey, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about social engineering. This is something that hackers use to convince you to let them into things like your bank account or for you to send them money. These have been effective in the past, but they are becoming much more effective because of things like ChatGPT being able to write really convincing emails that, given the right prompts, could convince a lot of people that whatever it is the hacker is trying to convince them of is legit. Like, for example, being able to craft an email saying, hey, there's an issue with your payment going through or there's a package that's supposed to be showing up soon. Click here to track it, stuff like that. Now, if you want some really good videos on this subject, there's this guy named Jason Street. He does pen testing and he's done quite a few videos at DEF CON and there's quite a few other videos on YouTube that you can go watch. His speeches at DEF CON are really good, especially this one with DEF CON 19, but he's got these others here that you could go check out. He's done some really interesting stuff. He does the business side. So he'll do pen testing engagements and an example that he gave in one of his videos, he's got some really good examples of things that he's done. But an example of one where he used social engineering to get into a business is where he went to a bank pretending that he was a person that worked for a nonprofit company. And he ended up talking to the person who was running the bank and convinced them to use a CD or a USB drive to install malware on the bank's network. And basically what companies do with guys like Jason is they hire them to come in and try to get into their network. And Jason prefers the physical approach. And I'll go through some stuff that we'll cover in this video that the physical approach is a lot of times easier than the digital approach, but the digital approach works really well for the people that know what they're doing. Anyway, I recommend going and checking out his channel. He's got some really good videos. These are actually really entertaining to watch. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. So this is basically, so when I say meta, for those that aren't aware, it just means most effective tactics available. This is becoming a much easier way to get people to install malware and steal stuff off their computer, steal their login credentials, or get access into their bank accounts, or convince someone to send money to do something or to get into a business and plug in like an infected USB drive on a computer. This stuff's gonna get a lot worse as time goes on these next few years with things like deep fakes. I'll make a video covering deep fakes at some time here in the near future. That's an entirely separate topic because those are going to become a big issue all in and of themselves. So I'll go through the high level overview first, and then we're gonna go through a breakdown of the different cognitive biases, because understanding the cognitive biases that are at play with social engineering is about the best way that you can protect yourself. I'll go through this a little bit later, but security software is not going to be the fix to protect yourself against this stuff. And so social engineering, anyone that understands human psychology can do social engineering really well. And so it works a lot better than, for example, like if someone was trying to break into a business network, it's a lot easier to social engineer rather than it is to try to get past the defenses for the company. I mean, unless their cybersecurity standards are absolute garbage, it's a lot easier for these hackers to social engineer their way into things. And so cognitive biases, like I said, people that understand cognitive biases, you have to know these to protect yourself against social engineering, but the hackers that understand cognitive biases are the ones that are really effective with this kind of stuff. And if you go watch Jason's videos, you'll start to understand that this is a hell of a lot easier to do to people than most people would think. Now it can come in a handful of different forms. So baiting is one of them. Baiting would be like you leave a, let's say you were to drop a hard drive or a USB drive. Now, a lot of people would hopefully not go and do this dumb shit of like plugging this into a home computer, or plugging this into an office computer, but there are still people that do it. That's what baiting is, is basically leave something out and bait them to go and plug it into a computer somewhere. Phishing, this one's pretty self-explanatory. Like someone sending you an email pretending to be like PayPal and saying, hey, there's a problem with your account. We need you to click on the link and log into it. Quid pro quo just means this is Latin. If you translate it literally, it means something for something. So a perfect example of this that is still used, it's been used for years and it's still being used, is someone calling, pretending to be tech support saying, hey, there's an issue with your computer. If you give me a access to your computer, I'll log in and fix the issue for you. Tailgating, this is applicable to the business environment. Now there's some people that watch my channel that work in IT and they are probably already aware of this, but I'll just explain this for people that are not aware of it. This is something that businesses have to be really careful about is tailgating. So for example, let's say that you work at a bank. Now most banks, as long as they have good security practices, one of the things that you'll see is the a little electronic keypads that usually there will be like a fob that you have to scan in order to 
access certain parts of the bank that are closed off. Now, let's say there's two or three employees that need to go into the server room. Tailgating would be if one employee scans their key fob to open up the door and then the other two just walk right in behind without scanning their key fob. It becomes an issue for a few reasons. Number one, let's say that the employee was caught doing something and the head of IT shut down all of their access to everything, but they haven't found them in the building and they're trying to get them out. That person could theoretically, if they were able to tailgate, is go in and, and do some sort of damage to the company. The other thing is, is let's say that some sort of a malware was installed through the server room and investigation comes up a year down the road to try and figure out, okay, well, we got hacked. Now we've narrowed it down to here's where it came from. They can go through the logs of who accessed the server room that day and say, okay, well, these three people scanned into the server room. The server room is where this malware came from. Now we're going to go talk to these three people. And if you allow someone to tailgate and something like that were to happen, for example, is now, well, you become a suspect in something and you're drawing a lot of it extra attention to yourself when the person who actually did it, at least initially, isn't on the radar. And again, I'll mention this for people that probably aren't aware of it. I'm sure everyone that watched my channel that's in IT understands that if you get caught letting people tailgate, if you work in a some sort of a facility, a, a bank or a business or some sort that has key fobs and you let someone tailgate and you get caught doing that, the first time you'll probably get an ass chewing, the second time you're likely to end up getting fired. So if you are looking at getting an IT because there's people that watch my channel that are looking to get into IT, you don't ever want to let people tailgate. Everyone needs to scan their key fob when they're trying to go through some sort of a secured access area. And then pretexting is where someone is convincing you that you need to give them information. So for example, let's say you get a phone call from someone and they say, hey, we're doing some sort of a survey. We're just looking to get a couple answers from you. And then you're like, oh, okay, well, this seems innocuous enough. You give them answers and then they're like, oh, okay, well, uh, what city do you live in? And maybe they ask for some other stuff, potentially an address or something like that. The ones that are really good know they can't push it too far or they'll attract a lot of suspicion, but that would be an example of pretexting as they are able to convince you to give them a couple pieces of information. Now this will come up through a few different methods. First of all is text. This one's a becoming a bigger issue like banks. People are impersonating like banks and sending out stuff. A, bit, a really popular one that I've seen coming up in the last year or two years now is Amazon, for example, is these hackers will pretend to be from Amazon and they'll send out like a text message and they'll say, hey, your package is due for delivery today. Click here to track the package. And people are like, oh, okay, well, I don't remember ordering a package. Let me click on that and see that. And then you hit that link and then that becomes a problem in and of itself. So I'm going to explain something here. Now, people might have seen me draw out funnels in the past as it relates to like sales and marketing. So you'd see funnels for like doing sales and marketing quite a bit. Now let's say you answer a phone call or you respond to a text message or something like that. So typically what will happen there is hackers either through like a data leak or they get your phone number some other way is they're testing the waters to see who's gonna respond, see if okay, is it still this person that owns the phone number? Do they answer phone calls? Do they click on our links and our text messages that we send? And a lot of times the, the initial efforts will be really surface level. So on a funnel here, so like in sales marketing, you break this down into three different layers. You have top of funnel here, middle of funnel here, bottom of funnel here. Now, like if you're answering phone calls or clicking on text messages, it becomes a huge issue because they're trying those phone numbers out. And if you don't ever respond to texts or phone calls, a lot of times after a while, they'll just leave you alone. But once you start responding to, to that stuff is then you come into this funnel here. And so then what they'll do is they're getting you to respond to really superficial stuff like, oh, click on this link and then it might just be something really innocuous. And they're like, oh, okay, well, this person clicks on links that we're sending them. We're going to move them farther down the funnel and come up with some elaborate scams to try to get money or some sort of piece of information out of them. Another thing that's really popular with text messages, and again, this is good social engineering from the people that use it, and I've seen this used quite a bit over the past couple of years, is these people that will send out text messages 
saying, hey, do you have some sort of appointment with us? We're, we're expecting you in here at this day and this time. And you're like, oh, well, I never made an appointment. And most people will think, oh, well, I never made that appointment. I better call them or I better text them and let them know that they have the wrong number. Again, once you do that, you go down into their funnel where they're going to come up with something more elaborate. It's very rare. Maybe there will be some times where someone actually does send you some sort of legitimate correspondence and they mess up and say, oh, well, you've got an appointment here when it's not actually the case. Case, but the vast majority of the times when you see text messages like that, and you're like, okay, well, that's, I never had an appointment. It's actually a scammer. Emails, this one's pretty self-explanatory. This one's been used a lot. Social media engineering is becoming a very common thing. I'm going to talk about this more when we get into the cognitive biases. But for example, you could take a look at something like the FTX scam that was going on. So you had people that were running this operation that they knew was scamming people. And so what they did is they went to like all these social media influencers and talked to them and built up with looked to be a really legitimate operation and then people were going and putting in a bunch of money and then it can also be stuff as simple as you get a message that looks like it's from someone else on social media sometimes it comes from people that are pretending to be influencers and the social media platforms are not some of them are not doing a good job of cracking down on accounts that impersonate people or accounts that look real, but they're actually not. I covered this a while back, but Twitter is a perfect example of this right now. This The crypto scamming on there isn't as bad as it used to be, but it is still pretty bad. And a lot of times you'll, like, you'll get tagged in tweets. If you have an account on there, you'll get tagged in tweets and saying, hey, uh, go purchase Ethereum through this link or whatever. And it's coming from accounts that have like one or 2,000 followers and they have a blue check mark and it's like, okay, well, it's kind of an issue when you're allowing people like that to have verification because then it signals to people, oh, this is a legit thing. Phone calls, pretty self-explanatory, things like tech support or things like people doing surveys. So another common one, I know I mentioned this a little bit, someone doing a survey and then they say, oh, well, we just need one or two pieces of information to uh, tie this survey to where it is that you live or something like that. Again, you go down the scammer funnel. IRL, this is mostly applicable to people that work in like some sort of a business. So like if you're working in IT right now, this is something you have to be careful of is the people that are really good. This is most often the most simple path and most often the most effective path is just doing IRL stuff, which we're going to cover that more here pretty soon. So let's cover the cognitive biases that come into play when it comes to social engineering. So the first one is the familiarity bias. Now the familiarity bias, this one's a really powerful one. This is actually one of my favorites that I've tried. Now I have never done any sort of malicious social engineering, but I have tried social engineering before and I'm telling you this is a absolutely a very powerful cognitive bias to use on someone. What this is, is that the more familiar you become with a person or a thing, the more you lower your guard or like the more you tend to favor it. And so like, for example, if I were to social engineer, if I were going to social engineer my way into a place and I had a very long time frame to do it, let's say a couple of months, is I would absolutely employ the familiarity bias and just do like a series of really touch and go, really casual touch points with people that I want to use to accomplish whatever it is that I'm trying to do. And to go along with that, so familiarity is really strong. The liking bias is also really strong. And I would tie these two together. Like if I were going to do anything that was going to use some sort of a cognitive bias, these combined are really good. The liking bias means that you tend to favor those who you like, or you also tend to agree with them more often just because you like that person. Now, there's a lot that goes into this one. First of all, you have to just in general be a pretty likable person. But like this is something that's used a lot in the sales industry, for example. So if you go to, let's say, a car dealership, for example, I'm sure a lot of people here have done that. You'll walk in and you'll notice, so now that you've been made aware of this cognitive bias, if you walk into some sort of like, let's say a car dealership, if you pay attention to this bias, you'll start catching this stuff. You'll notice the, the salesperson will try and figure out things that you like, things that you don't like, and then they'll try to frame things in a way that makes them seem like they're really likable to you because they're trying to get you to buy something from them. And if you're not familiar with this bias is you'll notice once you start paying attention to this stuff, it becomes really clear when people are trying to do intentionally get you to like them. Like some people, again, some people are just really likable. There's people that I watch on YouTube, for example, and I like watching them just because I think they're a cool person. Like for example, 
Tim Kane used to be the developer for the old Fallout games, and then he worked on Outer Worlds, and he has a YouTube channel that's been growing massively. And I don't do any sort of thing that's related with game development. I don't ever plan to be a game developer, but I like watching his videos just because he's a likable dude. So I'd say that's a pretty strong bias when I will spend time out of my day to watch videos of someone that I don't really care what it is that they're talking about. I just relate to some stuff that they're saying because they come across as a likable person. But again, that's a very powerful thing for scammers and using for social engineering. This is a really common one here, urgency. So I'm gonna talk about these two kind of together because you'll typically see these two cognitive biases together. The first is urgency and the second is scarcity. These are very popular in the world of marketing. When it comes to marketing, you cannot, you pretty much will not find any biases that are stronger than these two right here when it comes to marketing and sales, but they're also really effective for social engineering. So for example, let's say that you get an email from your bank and it looks really legitimate. You're looking at the domain that it was sent from, you're looking at how it was worded, and they say, hey, we've noticed some suspicious activity on your account. Uh, it's, we've triggered some sort of a fraud alert. We need you to log in and verify your activity. Now, if you get an email like that, you're like, oh shit, I better check that right away before someone goes and over the next 10 minutes goes and visits half a dozen sites and charges up a whole bunch of stuff. The scarcity bias, so like I said, these two are usually used together, but this one, I'll talk about this one separately. I'll give you a perfect example of this one. NVIDIA has done this really well over the past few years now with the whole crypto craze. Where like, if you look back at the GTX or the RTX 2000, the 3000 and the 4000 series, is there is that long period of time where Ethereum mining was still a very big thing and people were just buying up whatever graphics cards they could get. And it wasn't just Nvidia, it was AMD. It was old cards, it was new cards. But for a while it was damn near impossible to find something like a 2080 or a 3070 or if you could find them, they were on eBay listed for like six or 700 bucks over the MSRP and they were heavily used, used for crypto mining and things like that. Now, Nvidia could have pumped out a lot more of those cards than they did. And there was an article, it was released, it was about six months ago that I saw where Nvidia was saying that they were not going to really ramp up the production of the 4000 series. And I haven't noticed like huge supply issues with 4000 series. Like when I went to buy mine, I didn't have any issues finding it and I didn't pay above MSRP to get it. But that's an example of like a company will do that a lot. But like, let's say for social engineering purposes, where this could be used is somewhere like, let's say you follow someone and they're playing the long game where they want to scam people, but they're trying to build up a big enough pool that they can walk away with a big enough amount of money and then they release some sort of a thing that you purchase and they say, oh, well, this is a limited time thing. You need to, the buy-in amount is, let's say a couple thousand dollars, but I'm only gonna let 20 or 30 people buy this because whatever reason, they'll, they'll manufacture some sort of artificial scarcity out of it. And what it does is people are like, oh, I gotta be the first person to do that. I wanna get in and do this before everyone else does. That's an example of the scarcity bias. Consistency bias, this is also a really powerful, by the way, all of these cognitive biases are really strong. Consistency is a really strong one. This is where a person feels that they need to be consistent to their past actions and beliefs. Whether or not staying consistent to those presently or in the future is good for that person or bad for them. And a lot of this comes down to societal conditioning where we look at people who are inconsistent with what their beliefs are or inconsistent with just their daily actions in life. Like let's say showing up to work on time for a week and then the next week they show up 10 minutes late. We tend to look at those people like they have some sort of an issue. And I mean, sometimes maybe they do. But the issue with consistency bias is, again, people will do this even if it's not good for them. And so let me give you an example. If I were going to scam someone, social engineer someone using the consistency bias, here's how I personally would do it. So I'm the kind of person that, you know, the long game is one of the best ways to play things. These people that try and rush in and do something, it's like you're, you're gonna have a way harder time of doing that. But let's say for a consistency bias is I'm going out and looking through past data breaches and specifically data breaches of things like charitable organizations. And then I go through and I look through the transaction lists for, through these data breaches and I find the names phone numbers, email addresses of people that gave a large donation because most people that make large donations 
have the financial wherewithal to do a lot more stuff than people that would make small or no donations to a charitable organization. Then what I would do is establish a drip campaign, just very gently moving this person through the funnel, getting them to know me at first, just giving like some casual information, things like that before. At some point, what I would do is then drop on them once I had enough people that know, like, trusted me or who they thought, thought I actually was, but I'm actually not. And then I end up sending them one day, send them a link to a landing page. I'm like, oh, well, I do this charitable work. Here's this and that. And I get them to go there. And it's a fake landing page with a form to fill out things like payment information, get them to submit that. And then boom, now I've got credit card information. And by the way, I'm not condoning that kind of shit. I'm just saying that that's an example of something that if I were going to do this, that that's something that would be pretty effective using the consistency bias. And it's things that scammers do. Again, I'm just giving examples here. The next thing is the authority bias. This is where people tend to listen and follow more often people who are in some sort of a position that they perceive as some kind of authority. You give this idea that you are in some sort of specialized role or specialized position that has a lot of knowledge and then you work your way in. Now, for example, where what Jason will do and what he's talked about in some of his DEF CON videos is where he's gone into businesses saying that he's some sort of consultant or something like that, working for some sort of a tech company and he will convince people to let them walk around the building and do whatever it is that they want and then he'll plug in infected USB drives into computers. Typically where you will see authority, social engineering is more on the business side, but this can be used on individuals. So like someone just, or some random person over the internet could have someone that is pretending to be in a position of authority that in socially engineers them to do some sort of action. And then social proof. Now, when you're talking about the social proof cognitive bias, typically what this refers to is the herd mentality of a person sees a group of people doing something, so then they follow along and do the same. That could apply to social engineering, but what I'm really talking about here, an example of that would be like the FTX scam where one person sees a whole bunch of other people buying into some sort of a platform that's actually a scam and they're like, oh, okay, well, I need to do it. When I say social, social proof, a bias, what I'm referring more to as is scammers that will come up with something that looks legitimate. So for example, things like fake reviews, fake testimonial. If you want to see more on that, go look at Lewis Rossman's channel. But that would be an example of social proof, or let's say a scammer gets you over to a landing page and they have a bunch of what are actually fake social media posts with fake people giving some sort of a fake review or testimonial. They look real, but they're not actually real. This is an example of where social proof is used in social in the context of like social engineering. So let's talk about just some brief ways that you can protect yourself. So I'll cover this more in the deep fake video that I'm going to do here sometime in the near future, but the verification, how you verify stuff is legitimate is going to become much more important here in the near future. Because once deep fakes become like a really big thing, once the they get these systems to where things like an AI voice and then like a AI avatar become really believable, you're going to see absolutely explosive growth in social engineering. Like it's gotten a lot worse since ChatGPT has been around because they can write really convincing texts and emails. But once this stuff happens there, I mean, it's going to be absolutely ridiculous. And there's already people that have been falling prey to this. Uh, people, you can go search out like news articles of like there's an example of a mom that got a phone call and she thought her daughter had been kidnapped. I mean, stuff like that's going to become a very common thing. The verification to try to prove whether or not that's actually going on is going to be a little bit more tricky. People are going to have to really figure out, talk to like their relatives and people around them and try to come up with some sort of a system that, hey, if you get some sort of call or something that's really off, that doesn't seem right, here's what we'll do to try to verify whether or not that's real. Here's one of the biggest things that you really have to pay attention to is pay attention to behavior that's not normal. I know this sounds really cliche, but for example, let's go back to the email thing where people are, a lot of people have fallen for these texts and emails coming from Amazon saying, hey, you've got a package that's on the way. So for Instances like that, for example, you're going to have to become a lot more diligent about what it is that you are doing online. Because if you're like, okay, well, I haven't ordered anything from Amazon in the last couple of weeks. So it would stand to reason that it's you don't actually have anything that's on the way. 
And the quickest way for you to check would be to go to Amazon yourself and log in and check and see, oh, well, I don't actually have any packages that are on the way. And also the other thing on this, so I'm gonna come back up here to baiting real quick. So the other thing, this isn't actually like the definition of baiting as it relates to social engineering, but it kind of applies here. This is more of like rage baiting. So this is something that scammers, if they're really good, they'll, they'll do this, is they'll call people and say something like, hey, we are from your local cable company. We're gonna shut down your internet because you haven't paid your bill. And then you're like, well, I actually have paid my bill. And they say, no, you haven't. And we're gonna send you to collections. And then you, they'll get you all worked up and pissed off. And then they'll say, okay, well, we'll check your account. We just need to verify some details from you. And that's an example of something else that would not be normal is you're not gonna get calls like that. But this is actually happening to people that I know where people will call up and try to bait them, rage bait them into getting all worked up. And then in a person's, this comes down to, again, psychology, where a lot of people want to be right. They want to have the last word. They want to try to get one over on someone. And so they will let themselves fall into that trap of raging back at someone when that's what that person wants. You know, it's like when people will go and leave some sort of dumbass comment on a social media video. Like I see this on YouTube all the time. People like will go to a YouTuber's video and leave some sort of comment raging. And it's like, they want that person to respond because that person then gets a dopamine rush and then they're getting the person to do what it is that they want them to do. Like just don't even pay them any attention and that kind of stuff won't happen. And then the next thing is some security practices like 2FA could potentially help you here, but this really is the important part. Security software really isn't going to do much. Like it can help you out a little bit, but it's very little. Because the thing is, is, you can have the best security software, you can have your firewall tightened up really hard and use all these block lists and all this other shit. But if someone convinces you to download and install TeamViewer and then give them remote access or download, click on some link and download a virus, the best security software in the world isn't gonna protect you against something like that. And this happens to companies all the time because there's people that, I know there's some people that think that, oh, well, if I just get like the best antivirus ever like Kaspersky, then I'm safe. And I'm telling you that there's companies out there that have teams of cybersecurity people who use the absolute best EDR solutions and they monitor everything that's on the computer and it's super locked down. And all it takes is for one person to click on a link that they think is legitimate and it will just infect Every, it will infect the entire network. So software really isn't gonna do a whole lot to protect you. And then this has gotta be said and emphasized, links coming through emails these days, you should always ignore them. The other thing, so I'll mention this as well, because this is becoming more popular in the business realm, but I'm seeing it slowly start to come up with your average home user, is for example, you'll get these marketing emails that show up in your inbox of people saying, they'll try to sell you on some sort of product, like it'll be like a product catalog or something like that. And they'll send them every day or every other day, trying to get you to click on a link. Now, some of those might be legit coming from companies that never got your permission to start sending you marketing emails. But something that scammers have caught on to with this is they're, they know that a lot of people will click on the unsubscribe link. And what the scammers are starting to figure out slowly is that if they send out enough of these that people will click on the unsubscribe link, but if you click on the unsubscribe link, it takes you to an infected website. So the best practice these days when it comes to emails, just don't ever click any link, don't click on any links that come through you in text message, anything like that. The best way to protect yourself against this is be aware of the cognitive biases, because once you understand these are like, these are all tactics. Once you understand the tactics that the scammers use, you're much better protected against this kind of stuff. And so we're gonna wrap up on this. So there's just a couple of brief things that I will mention here as articles. I'll drop the links down below so you can go read in your own time if you want to. But here is an example. So this was a scammer that social engineered and used the authority bias and also the urgency bias, pretending to be the CEO of this company and convincing one of the finance finance department employees into wiring 50 million euros for a project. And they were able to stop the transfer of some of the money, but pretty much most of it was gone. This has become a very popular thing in the business world. Now, I think there's a case that could be made here that whoever was working in the finance department might've really dropped the ball on this and didn't 
do proper verification because when you're wiring money of this big of sums, there should be better verification measures in place than just getting an email from someone. So there is that aspect of it. And then there is this saying here over in Singapore. This is just a couple of examples, by the way. There's numerous examples out there. But this example coming from Singapore where there were these text messages sent out from this bank that it looked legitimate. And I was looking at the tweet and it looked like the text message actually did really come from the bank. And so this came in the form of clicking on a link where it went to a fake, fake bank website where they put in their login details and said, oh, click here to res you have some account issues that need to be resolved. This is an example of the urgency bias right here. So to end on this, this stuff is going to become a huge problem in the next couple of years. Understanding this stuff now is really important to protect your assets because they're going to become much more crafty about how they're able to use this stuff. Anyway, this video has gone on longer than I thought it was, so I'm gonna wrap it up there. Just a couple of things that I'll mention. Since Friday's video, I am up another thousand subscribers, so I would like to say thank you for all of the support that I've been getting. Like, it's just absolutely insane how much the channel has grown over the last month. The second thing, I have some major work projects that have come up recently that are going to take a lot of time and effort for me to work on. So for a while, I'm going to cut down the uploads to once a week. It will be on Friday. So this will be the last video that you see on a Monday for a while, probably at least a couple of months. These are some pretty big projects that I've got to get taken care of and I need to spend more time devoted to just getting this stuff taken care of and done and not falling behind on it. So you'll just see once a week videos on Friday and I'm still going to make the daily community posts for YouTube. They only take like a couple of minutes to type up so there's no reason that I can't keep doing those. I just can't keep the pace of two videos a week now that I've got all these projects that are coming up so I'll keep everyone updated on what's going on with those once I get things kind of wrapped up and taken care of I can go back to a normal upload schedule but for the time being it'll just slow down a little bit anyway appreciate the support as always hope you enjoyed the video if you have any questions go ahead and drop them down below and I will do my best to make sure they get answered and I will see you on the next one